Sure. I'm Melissa Langan. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the section of emergency medicine at Yale University. Understanding that you can't share specific patient information, can you discuss in general terms any specific cases where the use of capnography resulted in improving patient safety and the frequency of such cases? A couple of cases come to mind. One in particular is when I came in to help sedate an adolescent girl who had an elbow dislocation. And because of the procedure, she had to be laying prone on our stretcher. This made it kind of difficult for us to assess her respiratory rate and her respiratory effort. Naturally, one of the first things I thought about was adding capnography to help monitor her ventilation. Luckily, everything went well, but it was really helpful to have the capnography there in order to see how well she was breathing and not having any adverse effects from the sedation itself. On the other hand, we had another adolescent patient who was intoxicated. While he was waiting in a room, he had both his end tidal monitor on as well as pulse oximetry and a heart rate monitor. As I walked by the room, I heard the capnography monitor beeping. And when I went in there, the patient was apneic. Meanwhile, his heart rate monitor and his pulse oximetry were all normal. And in fact, his mom was sitting next to him in the room and no one may have noticed that he'd become apneic if it hadn't been for that monitor. Personally, have you observed improvements in patient outcomes related to using capnography? I like to use capnography in our patients that come in either intoxicated or as the result of some kind of drug ingestion. One of the serious side effects of these cases is they usually have depression of the respiratory status. Capnography is a great monitor to use in terms of watching their ventilation and knowing how long to observe them and when to start intervening in their care. Similarly, with patients with seizure disorders who come in seizing, it's a great way to monitor their respiratory pattern, their ventilation, and know when to offer further supportive care for these cases. Again, we do a lot of sedations in the emergency department. It's helpful to know the limitations of our sedations when our patients are getting into trouble and to enhance patient safety in those cases. Are there any other points we've missed that you would like to add? I think capnography is currently underutilized in our patients that are spontaneously breathing, and I think a lot of education needs to be done in terms of how to use this monitor and the patients it could be used for. It can really enhance safety in a lot of ways, and I think people need to think about using this more often. People should think about both high values and low values that indicate abnormalities in ventilation and what those numbers mean. And intervening in that is very simple in terms of patient stimulation or offering support. So there's a lot of ways we can use this that is just not out there yet. Even if you look at current sedation guidelines, they're very varied from field to field. A lot of them don't incorporate capnography yet. I hope that's somewhere we go in the future and people should be thinking about that on an individual basis for now.